and then I can share it with the I can share it with the your group uh with your group and then it can be shared out to you after. Thank you and I think we can begin. So when it comes to bridging um, law and technology, we are at a position where generally in the world and in the country, technology is technology advancement has become one of the leading areas of practice, be it uh, in businesses, be it in development. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an aspect that we cannot uh, do without. And that being the case, it has also created a lot of jobs, especially for young people, where we have different facets, be it software development, be it uh, different aspects of technology. But mostly from the questions I was given, I think I'm dealing with a group of people who deal more with software development. So when we come to understanding the legal aspects that come to technology, maybe the first thing we should be able to talk about will be the laws that cover you or what it is, what laws are there in the country that you're supposed to know, or you're supposed to study to be able to know how to evolve or evolve in the landscape of technology in Kenya. So generally the legal framework of technology in Kenya is uh, under the Data Protection Act. I know most of you have heard about this. I know it is something that has been talked about. If we look at a um, study or a case study of something that happened last year, uh, there was an issue where Naivas was cited for failure to protect data from <clears throat> foreigners. And when they were dispersing their data, rather, there was an issue that the data was not protected. So for such issues, uh, legally, it is covered under the Data Protection Act. This is, a, this is an act everyone should be able to read. It's readily available for you to understand the parameters to which you're supposed to protect the data that you're collecting, be it personal data from your client and the data that you're processing. Because this, this is one of the major issues that will cause you issues when you, especially as a software developer, because every other day you're collecting data. For example, uh, if you're doing, um, let me put an example of um, what, um, a food delivery app, for example. The person will input their data, be it their location, be it where they're based, be it their payment methods, uh, or, or for some, something like Jumia, you may find that someone may also attach or may be asked to input their credit card number. So that information you're, that you're collecting has to be protected. So that protection now comes under the Data Protection Act. It is what guides you to know how you're going to process that, that data and to what parameters. Um, the other one that you need to know about majorly is the Kenya Information and Communications Act. This deals majorly with people who are in telecommunication. Yes. Um, as I was saying, uh, we have the Kenya Information and Communications Act. This governs the telecommunications, broadcasting, and electricity electronic transactions. So this is majorly for broadcasting companies, e.g. KBC, any telecommunications company, Safaricom, they're guided by the Kenya Information Communication Act. It may tally with what you're doing in some aspects, especially if you're developing something or something that goes under the ambit of uh, telecommunications. If you're dealing with networks, this is the act that guides you. Uh, the others are just simple acts such as the national ICT policy. This is this provides a framework for your ICT development and usage. This is a policy. It just guides you. It's a framework guiding you as an ICT develop, developer on what it is that you're required to have, the regulations and uh, the licenses. Majorly, that is what guides you. Then the other one is the Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act. This is a 2018 act. It has not been very... Uh, it's not very prominent, it's just coming up. It has been there, but it has not been very prominent in terms of um in terms of what? In terms of usage, but it addresses the cybercrime and unauthorized access and data breaches. Again, this works hand in hand with the Data Protection Act. Um after that, I think now we can move into what it is as a software developer that you need to know when it comes to 
your development or where you work because I've seen mostly you are asking about work and such issues. So I will give I will I will use an example. Uh, let me just use a name that is here. Maybe I use an example of uh, Bruce. So Bruce is a software developer. Wherever he's working, uh, he can be working independently or he can be working where he's employed. So this brings the question or the, or the question to, are you employed under a contract or are you employed under an independent contractor? So when you're beginning your terms of work, whether it is a contract that you've been given, those are the two issues that you need to separate or those are the two issues that you need to ask. So under employment, this is where you're doing an eight to five every day. You have been given uh, contractual ob obligations as an employee. That, me that means that you benefit from what is given under the Employment Act of Kenya as an employee, all the benefits that go with it. You get your NHIF, you get your NSSF, then, the other, then you are also covered under the par parameters of an employee, a general employee. What are your terms of work as an employee? What's, what, what does your contract say? That is an employment contract. So if, for example, Bruce is working for Safaricom as an employee, he will be given an employment contract. That employment contract will detail his work as a software developer within the company. Bruce may as well be working for Safaricom, but he's not under employment. He has come in to work for Safaricom for a duration of time to develop a specific software under a contract. So he now has something, he has a contractual obligation for a specific period of time, but he's not termed as an employee. He has been given a contract, but not as an employee. He becomes an independent contractor. So those are the two different facets at, as, at which you may be working uh, for a company or for yourself. Bruce may as well have his own company. For example, uh, let, it, let us call it Bruce Technologies. So he may, as Bruce Technologies, be contracted by another company to develop a software for them. So company to company, they will hire uh, Bruce Technologies under in, an independent contractor, not as an employee. So that is, I think, where we need to begin so that we may be able to understand the different facets. So when you're an employee, what happens? What are your obligations as an employee in a company? So under the Employment Act, we have casual employment and we also have permanent and pensionable employment. So casual employment, if you go and, for example, someone gives you a software development job, but does not give you a contract because we have these handshake deals. Someone tells you, I have something coming up and I would want you to create something for me for a short period of time. And maybe you work for them for a month or so. That may be deemed as casual where there is no contract. But if you consecutively work for someone for three months, under their premises, then after three months, it deems it automatically stops being casual employment and moves into, into a contract, whether the contract has been given or not, whether the company has provided you a contract or not, as long as you've worked with them for three months consecutively, then automatically it becomes, uh, you, you are supposed to be given an employment contract. So you are under employment. So now when you're under employment, what questions do we ask? If you come up and you want to understand what does employment mean to you, then if, what does your contract pertain? Your contract will definitely, of course, tell you you're an employee under the company. They will also tell you, they will, the contract will stipulate uh, your working hours. It will also stipulate how much money you're going to be paid at the end of the month, be it gross or net, either inclusive of taxes or uh, exclusive of taxes. You are also uh, you also have the benefits that the government has given. Being, if you're an employee, then your company is supposed to pay your NSSF, it's supposed to pay your NHIF, it's supposed to pay your housing levy. All other benefits that an employee gets under the Employment Act, you are supposed to benefit from it. Your contract is supposed to detail those benefits. It's supposed to detail your scope of work. It's supposed to detail you as a software developer within the company, what exactly are your KPIs? What exactly are you supposed to do as, an, as a software developer for the period of time that you're working with them? Your contract is also supposed to detail your timing. Uh, once, you, once you get into employment, 
the company will give you an offer letter, for example. If it's not an internship, they will give you an offer letter. So an offer letter, once you accept the offer letter, anytime you're given an offer letter, maybe you've gone for an interview, then they've given you an offer letter, you need to accept that offer letter in writing. Please note, if you do not do it in writing, it may be deemed that you've not accepted. You may resume, you may assume work, but having it in writing is very important because if the company does change its mind within that period of time, you can sue them, for example, for unfair termination because you have proof that you did accept in writing. So once you're given an offer letter, they normally give you about seven days to confirm whether you'll be working for them or not. Please make sure that your confirmation is always in writing. So after then you're given the offer letter, they will give you a probationary period. Most companies give you a probationary period of about six months. So for those six months, they're evaluating to see and know whether you can work for them. So within those six months, you are not entitled to the benefits of an employment contract, such as leave days. So within those six months, most companies don't give you the leave days that go under your employment contracts. They don't give you the sick offs that go under the employment contract. They may You may benefit from it, but it is not cast on stone. So during the probationary period, of course, it's about putting your best foot forward and waiting for the company to confirm you. So once your six months are done, they will have a review. And after the review, if they deem it fit that you have shown that they can work, you can work with the company, then they will now give you an employment contract. So please note that an offer letter is very different from an employment contract. Most people will give you an offer letter. The offer letter will stipulate the terms of your probationary period. It may be six months, three months, two months, depending with the company. But upon six months, they will either terminate you or they will give you an employment contract. So during that period where you're working under probation, they, mostly they give they, they give you seven days notice uh, when they are either going to approve you for permanent employment or if they are going to terminate you. If they don't give you um, the notice within the seven days notice, then you can actually uh, write to them claiming that you know this is this is unfair they should have given you notice they should pay you for termination in lieu of notice so after the probationary period once you're confirmed now you're given employment so once you move from probation please make sure that if the company tells you that you're going to continue working for them insist to be given an employment contract because where you don't have an employment contract you're not covered Again, I know I did say, even if after three months you've worked for that company where they have not given you any form of contract or documentation to sign, you automatically become an employee. You still will miss out on a few, uh, you will miss out on a few things that the Employment Act gives you because you don't have the contract. So after the probation period, if the company confirms you, then get the employment contract, insist on it. Insist on getting a contract, Make sure once you get the contract, you get an advocate to review it for you because there are very many terms that may be missing in the employment contract that are meant to cover you. Again, remember, if you are an employee, the company will always tend to cover themselves more than they cover you. So once you give it an employment contract, don't rush into signing it. Um, maybe have a lawyer review it to confirm that the terms that are in the employment contract favor you as well because it may be missing some things that could come to be an issue later, especially where you're either summarily dismissed or you're dismissed without pay. We always go back to the contract that you're given to see what were your terms. Are we together until then? Any questions? If anyone has a question, maybe they could ask. Okay, then I think we can proceed. So in your employment contract, the things to look out for are, like I said, uh, it should have your details very, very well written. So they will ask you for your details. Make sure whatever details you give are what is in your ID, uh, your phone number, the same, your next of kin. They will take, they will take your, it's called the personal data. They will collect your personal data and then ask, make sure once you're given your letter, please make sure you, you confirm that the details are the same because those small, small issues where the name was not the same, 
they may they may very well say that this is not the same person. Will it pass in court? Probably not, but it just makes this very contentious. So make sure that your details are proper. Then after that, uh, make sure that your scope of work is very well detailed. What is the company employing you to do? So that once you are in employment and the company is going beyond your scope of work, you can go back to the contract and tell them whatever you're asking me to do is beyond what I've been contracted to do. And if I have to do this, then uh, maybe we increase pay or maybe uh, you're given a different position or you're given a promotion because companies tend to do this. You've been employed as a junior software developer. Maybe for you, the only thing you're supposed to do is uh, work with uh, what maybe you're given a very specific area to work on but then it gets to a point you realize your work is increasing but you're so this happens so let your scope of work be very detailed uh secondly after your scope of work uh make sure that your pay is in your contract how much is the company going to pay you as an employee let that pay be explicit too they are going to pay you 30,000. Is this inclusive of benefits, the, the statutory benefits, the statutory provisions or not? So that if it is just, if, it, if, if you're negotiating your salary at that point, for example, they've said 30,000, make sure you ask. Make, it is always good to ask, is this 30,000 going to be inclusive of my NHIF, NSSF? Uh, is this gross or is it net? So that if it is gross, and it is below what maybe you you don't you are expecting, or you, you know, just make sure that this is done. Then once you're once once you once you're in the company and maybe you start getting your pay slips, please keep them. Keep them because it's important to follow up. Most companies tend to tell you they are going to pay your NHIF, NSSF, they're going to pay for your housing levy. And then you find that they don't. So when you want to go to court. Uh, after maybe there has been unfair termination, you're now going, you're, that is the time when you're terminated, that's when you find out that the company has not been paying these things. Or for example, you've been sick, you've gone to hospital, the company is supposed to, uh, NHF is supposed to cover you. But then you find the company has not been remitting this. Yet in your pay slip, it shows that the deductions have been made. So even though the company is showing you that deductions have been made, it is important. Mm -hmm. It is very important to follow up yourself because once you're given an NSSF number, you can you can always follow up and know whether the deductions have been remitted. So that once you can be able to know at what point did the company stop paying if they don't pay mm -hmm. and why have they not been paying? Or you can ask them. I can see that my pay slip says that uh, you deducted 500 shillings for housing left, for example, but I don't see it or for NSSF, but when I check my NSSF, these this amounts have not been remitted. That way you're able to follow up and keep the company on toes at all time. Remember, uh, you are the only person who has your own best interest, wherever you're working. The company, wherever you're working, the company is looking at you as an employee for you to produce and help them build whatever it is they're building. So whatever else goes, whatever else you need from the company, you always have to follow up. So after you make sure that your pay has been indicated in your employment contract and your scope of work has been included, please have, make sure your employment contract shows your working hours. And because you are in a new age, let your contract be specific. Are you working offline? Are you working uh, remotely? Or are you working physically in the company? And to what extent? If the company allows for both, then what are your working days in the office? If they're giving you two days in the office and the rest you're working remotely, then what parameters have been given? We've had a situation where someone has been, the company says you can work remotely, but then when they were terminated, because when they were going to work, there was a, you sign in with a fingerprint, right? So they could come, sign that they've come, they've come into work. So they would come twice a week, they'd sign that they've come into work, and it shows they've come to the office twice. So when the company summarily dismissed them, uh, they say this person has been summarily dismissed because they've not been coming to work. But he says, but we've been working remotely. I've been able to work remotely. But there is no proof that he's been working remotely. Why? Because his contract says that he's supposed to be in the office physically. So even though the company allowed it, it was not in the contract. 
So it becomes a very hard case to prove. Again, when you're working remotely and there is nowhere you are logging in that shows that you logged in your hours, it becomes very hard to prove. So if a company is giving you such options, make sure these stipulations have also been given in your contract, that the contract is very clear, that yes, you are an employee for the company, but you'll be working remotely. Or you'll be working physically and remotely. It's a hybrid. And to what extent does this hybrid work? After that, um, then now you can move off, of course, normal office hours. What else you need to make sure your contract has is the termination clause. The termination clause is very important. It says, for example, you as an employee, having work, having um, having been given a contract, if you do decide to resign, then this is what will happen. You will give one month's notice, and if you don't give one month's notice to the company, uh, then they will not pay you for that one month. It's called a payment in lieu of notice. The same, the same case. If the company wants to terminate you, they are supposed to give you notice, and that notice should be as per what is in your contract. So some contract will say two months, some contract will say one month, but generally under the law, it's normally one month unless it's probationary period where it is normally seven days. Make sure the termination clause is present at all times. Then other, other small, small things that normally have to be there, like I said, your sick days, your off days, your leave days, make sure they are stipulated in the contract. Let the company be clear that they're going to be giving you 21 days leave as per our act. Some give 28. Let them stipulate that you're going to have off days. Let them stipulate that either you'll be working on holidays or not. Let your contract stipulate whether you're working on Saturdays or not because it is very important, because that covers their, because if they're going to tell you you're working a 40-hour week, then where is a 40-hour week? Is it Monday to Friday or Monday to Saturday? So let them stipulate those small small details that are important to make sure that they are covered. That is under the employment contract. And then um, make sure they stipulate maternity leave, paternity leave, it is necessary. They give a timeline so that you know if, if you are a, a guy, is the, is the organization giving you two weeks paternity leave or is it giving you one month? And is it paid or unpaid? The reason I specified about uh, off days and sick off is because some companies are very particular. They will give you sick off for seven days. Then, of course, after that, because that is what is provided. Then after that, now when you start taking off days because maybe you are, your, your ailment has extended, then you may be given off days that are either halfway paid or are unpaid. So those specific things have to be highlighted in your contract. Um, generally, that is what should be in an employment contract. Then they should also detail, your employment contract should detail disciplinary issues. They will, it should have uh, an ambit that talks about what happens where there are disciplinary issues that have been raised. So some companies highlight this in the contract. Others give you an employee handbook. So where, wherever you're working, Inquire if these things are not are not uh, within the contract. Where do you get this stipulation? It can either be an employee handbook, or they will give you an employee code of conduct. So the employee code code of conduct will stipulate, especially termination disciplinary issues, because if, for example, you cannot you cannot be terminated summarily unless you have done yeah. something within the company that is deemed uh, excessive. For example, you have leaked uh, confidential information that is meant to be confidential. Then the company can automatically summarily dismiss you for that. But those stipulations have to have been given to you when you are beginning work. What does summary dismissal for this company mean? Beyond what is in the law, what will be deemed as, uh, what will the company deem as summary dismissal for you? So the employee code of conduct should be able to cover that. And uh, the employee code of conduct or the employee handbook should have that, or it will be in your employment contract. So if it is not in your employment contract, inquire and be given the document so that you know when you're working in this organization, what is expected of you. Because the, every company has a code of conduct. It is necessary, it is a must, and if they don't, please ask for one. If they've not, don't wait for the company to just automatically give you these things. It is important for you to ask, because these are the things that protect you. If they, if they send them in soft copy, I always advise um, have them let them let them have the stamp of the company because you may just be given something in soft copy that is just written employee code of conduct but does not signify the company. So you can always have them print, printed and stamped so that you can have them in hard copy. It it helps. This again, I'm looking at the end 
at the very end where you have a situation where you have to go to court. The reason I'm, I'm insisting on having this documentation is if in an event you have to go to court or for arbitration, these are the things as an advocate I will ask you for. You come and tell me um, the company has given me a termination letter. I will ask you for your employment contract. I will ask you for your employee code of conduct because if, for example, you've been dismissed from your employment because of um, incitement, for example, or you have breach of contract or breach of confidentiality or even regular issues that you're seeing now, such as sexual harassment, right? I will ask you for these things because I want to know what did the company provide? What evidence is the company having against you so that we can match the two and see whether you have a case. Again, the employee code of conduct should also come with the sexual harassment uh, code of conduct. Now we have a sexual code of conduct that every organization has to have and should provide to their employees. So those are the things you ask for. Generally, that is what your employment pertains. If you are working under employment, those are the things you need to look out for. And then now maybe after that, just make sure that uh, you're, you're paid on time. If you're not paid on time, then you can always ask. Remember again, the HR, as much as they are there to protect you, mostly the HR will always cover the company. The company lawyer will always cover the company. So be diligent in making sure you have all your documentation. Be diligent in making sure that if you're being paid, for example, make sure everything is documented. Don't, don't allow a company to pay you cash. Don't, for whatever reasons, don't. Make sure it is either through bank transfer or through m -Pesa, but please insist on bank transfer. Most companies uh, do banks. Others will do m -Pesa. Those that do m -Pesa, just make sure you keep your statements. Because most of the time, you find that it's not... Most, most people don't um, keep this documentation. So when it comes to going to court, it becomes very hard to prove your case. Keep the employee code of conduct and I think you'll be fine. So that said, I think I've covered employee contract. Then now we can move into independent contract, which is what most, most software developers are. Uh, when, when I was asking about the, the age bracket for the group I'm addressing today, I realized most of you may still may still be beginning so most of you may begin under employment as you now move into independent contractors. So an independent contractor is a consultant. A consultant is given a contract for a specific period of time. So you as an independent contractor may actually find that you're the one who is going to provide the company with the contract, not the other way around. So you've come, uh, you've met Coca-Cola, for example, they've given you, they've told you to create an app that will serve for the purpose of this duration of time, maybe they're advertising something or something like that. They want something that works for them. And it's it's uh it's not something it's not something that requires you to be employed and work there for a period for the for the next 10 years. So they'll give you a contract or you will work on a basis, a contractual basis for a period of time. Most of the software development contracts I have had or I have created have been uh, between six months to one year. The first six months being the development, and then after development, the next six months being uh, maintenance. So you you can either match the two contracts to be software development and maintenance of the site, or you can have independent contracts that are very specific to development. Then after that, if the company is willing to still have you on board, to do the maintenance, then you can have a maintenance contract, which is which I've realized is what most people are, are opting for, because you find that a company will have you for development, then maybe they'll want a different company for maintenance. So you can have the two separate, or you can have them as one if the company is willing to onboard you for the whole process. So what an independent contract means, or an independent contractor is, you're not an employee. So you're not privy to the benefits that the government gives or the statutory benefits that you get as an employee. The company doesn't pay your taxes. The company doesn't pay for your NHIF, your NSSF, your housing levy, all the statutory benefits that are given under the Employment Act. As an independent contractor, you are not privy to. Secondly, as an independent contractor, you do not represent the company in any capacity. Under employment, if you developed something, and whoever you are developing for, maybe the company was developing and then maybe sharing it or selling it to another company, and then there was a fault, the company you employed under will assume the risk. Under an independent contractor, you assume the risk fully. 
the company does not assume the risk for you. Because sometimes when you're under employment, you're by, the company is, we say the company is vicariously liable for you. So even if someone were to sue you independently because you're the one who developed it or you're the one who leaked the information, they would sue you and sue the company because the company becomes vicariously liable. But where you have an independent contract, you are you are independently liable for everything that happens. That is the difference. So under an independent uh, as an independent contractor, like I've said, you don't have these benefits. You are, you are personally liable for whatever comes up uh, during development. For some independent contractors, like I said, I gave an example of Bruce having Bruce and Technologies or Bruce acting independently as Bruce and being a software developer. So where he's dealing as Bruce and Technologies and he's taking up a contract as Bruce and Technologies, then even the team that he works with as an independent contractor, you facilitate everything. You come with the, yourself, the, the company, you come with your own employees. Under your contract, you can stipulate that. You can stipulate that you will have the people you work with. All that you need to do is uh, now give the product to the company that has uh, given you the contract. But everything else that details the job, it's you and your company. So this is where now you discuss payment with the company wholesomely. The company will now not come and pay your employees. It will not come and pay whoever you on board. Because you may get a contract today to create something and maybe, um, for example, I've seen this is a flatter community. So maybe someone else is, is uh, developing under a different language, right? So you do not know how to use that language. You, you subcontract someone to do it. The company that contracted you has no basis paying that person. It is everything is under you. So the company will negotiate with you in terms of the six months. How much will it cost to develop this app? It will cost me five million shillings. This is inclusive of what? Whatever payments that you're going to make, um, if you're paying for services, if you're paying for hosting, all those things, uh, the company will give you, you will discuss in brackets of what exactly it is that you want. If you're charging 5 million, it's inclusive of this and this. So you charge as an independent contractor, always remember to charge inclusive of VAT. So if you're going to tell this person you're, you're charging them 5 million, make sure you say it's 5 million exclusive of VAT. Then do the 16% because right now, like you've seen, we now have digital tax. Yeah? So now include VAT uh, because if you're paying 15 million, of course your VAT, you, you are uh, that level where you need to now be paying for VAT. So you do 5 million inclusive of 16% VAT, then you give your subtotal. So you can do that. You can do all something, or you can tell you can tell the company, this is what labor will cost. This is what we are going to charge you. 5 million is not inclusive of development uh, uh, fees, for example. If you're doing hosting and all other things that you may need to do for the company, um, I did a contract for someone who was very specific. Everything else that needed to be paid for, for purposes of having that site live, the company had to pay for. So they charged separately for what is their labor. Then they gave a very detailed breakdown of how much it's going to cost. They were developing a website for Naivas. So how much it's going to cost to have this website live, what goes into it, how much is supposed to be paid, they detailed. And then now plus the 16%. So the company knows that anything that requires for them to pay, that will be paid directly. It is not inclusive of your fees. So you can have both. You can either do wholesomely or you can do your labor. Then everything else that the company needs to pay for, you stipulate and then you do the 16%, which I think makes a lot of sense because you find that during your development, when you're doing development, some things change. The dollar rate changes, for example, because I've realized most people who do development, the things, most of the, whatever you're doing and paying for is in dollars. So when, the, when this fluctuates and you had not indicated that the company will pay directly, it eats into what is it? What it is that you are charged for labor? Remember, your labor may be inclusive of other people that you're paying. If you're a company, you have about six, seven employees. You need to pay them from the amount of money that you're being paid. So, if the dollar rate has changed and it has eaten into what you had been paid, then you now end up having a loss. So, those are the stipulations. I think uh, when you're doing your contract, when you're doing your payment schedule, make sure you include uh, those specific uh, small, small details that make your work so much easier. Have a schedule that is detailed in terms of what the company the company expects, 
what it is that you're going to provide for them and how much it's going to cost. An independent contractor does not necessarily having work, have working hours. Your contract may have it, but it is it is open. As long as you've been given a timeline of maybe six months, um, then it's open. Just make sure that your deliverables have been given within that that period. You find that uh, when you're giving your timelines, um, uh, your duration, uh, these they're called deliverables and milestones. So your contract will have those deliverables. It will say maybe for the first three months, it's a prototype delivery. And then uh, within the six month mark, then you should have done the uh, beta version. So make sure those stipulations are very clear. So that again, the company now does not go and sue you and say, this why you are your deliverables and you have failed to do it. Make sure it's very particular. This is what we are going to provide to you within the one first month. This is what we're going to provide to you within the second month. Again, scope of work. This will now go into the scope of work. When you're doing your independent contract, it's the same as um, the employment contract. In terms of details, make sure the details are very clear between the company and yourself. Who is who? What is the what is the um, contract? Who are who are the parties? Then after the parties, then you go into a detailed description of the product. Please detail everything this product is supposed to be. What are they asking you to develop? be as clear as you can um, so that you don't have an issue of uh, where the company is saying that this is what we asked for, this is what you gave us. So we are not going to take this because it doesn't amount to what we said. So be very particular because at the very end, I think uh, when you when you are delivering the product, you do deliver with the report and there is a checklist. So once they are going through this, this checklist please never give never deliver product without it make sure you have a report that it is there is documentation that comes with every application so once when you're delivering the product have the product together with the, um, the documentation so you will compare that checklist to now what i'm talking about the detailed description of the project be very detailed as much as you can to the letter a b c d this is what we are going to do. This is what is expected. Then after that, I also talked about the payment terms. Once you're talking about, uh, if you're talking about, for example, like I said, 5 million, you've detailed, your payment terms also need to include your deposit and balance. Remember, again, this is an independent contract. This is not on a month-to-month -month basis. It's not an employment. You may agree that uh, for the next six months, they're going to be paying you a million a month, for example, if you're paying... Like I said, we are using 5 million, 6 million. So you may agree to have a million shillings paid every month. Or you may tell them, this is piece work. So you're going to pay me maybe 40% uh, now deposit. Then you're going to pay me 30% at the, at the three months stage. And then you're going to, final, to finally pay the other 30% at the very end. But it is important to detail that kind of payment. Again, don't begin work where deposit has not been paid, especially as an independent contractor. The issues you're going to face with these companies when they refuse to pay, you remember, if they don't pay you, you're going to have to use your own money for development. Using your own money for development is extremely expensive with no guarantee that these people are going to pay. So you have to have a detailed schedule of the deposit that is going to be paid. I always ask that the deposit is higher than any other amount. So 40% may be upfront, then 30%, then 30%. Or if you're paying in two installments, let your deposit always be higher than what is the final, what will be your final payment. Do, let it not be the other way around. You cannot begin work on a lower, it, it disadvantages you at all times. So let your deposit always be higher. Then after that, um, again, detail your, your payments, how your payments will be done, your bank, all that. Make sure that is done. In your payment schedule, also include what happens where we have issues of expenses that were unexpected. As you find, as I found majorly when you're doing development, you find that during that development period, the client may come up with other things that they may want. It is very normal. They want to change this. Um, they want to do something else. Some new things may come up or they may have done some research and found that they want to include something different that was not there before. So let your contract be specific that whatever else comes after, whatever else comes after that is not detailed within this, 
or if you incur expenses on behalf of the company that has contracted you, how do you recover that money? It has to be particular, it has to detail that in case there are any changes or additional work, it will be built. What are the change what are the changes in scope will be built at will be built at how much? For example, if you're charging hourly, then charge hourly. If you're charging as for the work, then charge as for the work. But detail that in case there is additional or there will be changes made, then you will charge for it and how it will be charged. If you will incur expenses, detail in your contract that for whatever expenses you've incurred, be it, uh, for example, you're doing a site, you're creating a site in Nairobi, but you have to now go and have it, um, it's, it's supposed to be used in Naivasha. So now you're supposed to go and, I'm, I'm, I'm losing the term, but I don't say upload, but you're supposed to go and install it, for example, in Naivasha. Those charges, be it transport, be it uh, wherever you will sleep, be it the team you will go with, those details that may come later, include them. So for such issues or for client meetings that may come up because they may want you to meet with different people, if you're going to incur charges, make sure again, detail that you will give, um, what is it called, receipts. Because there's no way also a company is going to pay you back for something you cannot prove. So if you're going to incur extra charges, please keep your receipts and then detail in your contract that you will provide detailed receipts and the company should reimburse you for these things. Then um, the other thing your independent, your contract should have, so you, I, I call it, mostly I just call it a software development contract, is intellectual property. Let me go back to employment for one minute. When you're employed by a company, whatever it is that you're creating for them becomes a property of the company. As long as you're doing it within the company hours, as long as you're using the company resources, as long as you are employed within the company, it is not your property. This is why I said, make sure you note the difference between the employment contract and the independent contract, independent contractor contract, or the consultancy contract. So when you're working for a company as an employee, whatever you create for them, you can never claim that it is yours at any point. Because the contract mostly, an employment contract, especially for developers, will detail that the company has ownership rights. Okay? So the company retains ownership to the source code and everything and the software. That will be in your employment contract. So whatever you create under employment remains with the company. But now come to an independent contractor, you will now need to have a clause for intellectual property rights. So this is where it will detail the ownership of the software. So depending with your kind of contract, are you creating a software? Are you creating, are you developing something for purposes of licensing or are you creating a product for the company? So if you're creating a product where it remains yours, you own it, but you license a company, your clause in your contract will be very specific that the ownership of this product is yours. So the source code and the software is yours but you are only giving licensing rights to the company. Where the company has contracted you and the product is theirs, then ownership of the software remains to be the company's and the licensing terms will also be given. Now you may be given uh, some perpetual license, maybe for purposes of uh, using the site. The company will grant you the license for purposes of development, but it's, it has to be very specific. So where you're creating the product, it's yours, but you're licensing, make sure you have ownership of the software clause and licensing, licensing terms. Um, then after that, you will now go into every contract has to have a confidentiality clause. This cuts across the board uh, between an employment contract and uh, an, a consultancy contract. The confidentiality clause will be very specific on the parameters of uh, what confidentiality means, what sensitive information is, and it will be very particular about the information you can give and cannot give. So under this, under the confidentiality clause, you can you can do you can have it written together as a confidentiality, and under it you can stipulate now the non-disclosure clause you had asked about. But I always encourage have a confidentiality clause, but have a specific contract for non-disclosure because a non-disclosure clause is contracts can be a bit more detailed as compared to confidentiality. 
again have have a termination clause every every contract has to have a termination clause what happens you as an independent contractor when can you terminate maybe within 30 days notice and then the other party as well define what happens when termination comes up remember you may decide to terminate and they paid you so how do you reimburse that money uh, if you terminate the contract before the six months and they have not paid you how do they now pay you for the months that have worked so those details, it's called uh, client, how you will pay for the work completed up to the termination date. So your contract has to be very specific on such terms. What happens? Because you may find that a company gave you a contract, but for some reason you're not able to work with them, or your ideologies and theirs, for some reason they, they are not they're not working. So you may decide to terminate before. So what happens to the work that you've already created? How are they going to pay you for the work that you've already created? Your termination clauses should be very, very particular. Again, have the have the um, obligations, the role and, and obligations of each party. What is the obligation of the client? The client being the person who's given you the job. And what is your obligation as a developer under this contract? And what are your obligations in case of third parties? Where they are subcontractors? Like I said, and as an independent contractor, you may find that you may mostly have subcontractors. So your, your agreement has to detail what are the particulars of these subcontractors. Some company may be not before it, they may say do not subcontract, and they may want to give you a team from their own company, again, to, to make sure that uh, information that they want to remain confidential remains confidential. So a, a company may stipulate that, no, we will work with you, but we will want to give you our own team to work with. Or you may stipulate that if I'm going to work with you, I have to work with a team that I know can deliver. So this team may come with sub subcontractors. So what happens in such situations? Then have a, a risk management and dispute resolution clause. This says what happens during dispute when when disputes arise. So mostly you don't rush to court every other time. So your dispute resolution clause, especially for Software developers uh, or normal contracts, we normally have an arbitration clause, which stipulates that before you actually proceed to court, you may have an arbitrator look at the matter. And then there's also notice. If, for example, um, the, the breaching party, for example, uh, made with the company, the ones who breached on their agreement, then maybe give them notice uh, in terms of the breach, give them a time period to correct the breach. And then now, if they don't correct the breach, then you may either terminate or may, you may choose to have an arbitrator. The same for the client, for the contractor. If the, if the contractor is one who's breached, the company can give you notice to remedy your breach, which now, if you don't, then they can terminate, which is generally what people do. You just don't wake up and terminate a contract because it's not working for you. If the company is having an issue or you're having an issue, always give notice. Give notice of the breach, give a timeline to remedy the breach, which now, if it is not done, then you proceed to terminate and maybe sue if there's requirement for suing or have an arbitrator to see whether you can solve the issue. Um, that is exactly majorly what should be in your independent, as an independent contractor, that is what you should focus on in your contract. I had seen someone had asked a question. Um, should you want me to explain? Yes, get uh, I'd yes. Oh, yeah. Um, so wouldn't there be other evidence that you've um, completed work, such as, um, yeah, snippets of code basically get commits um, other than checking into work? This was Come in again? regards to a previous, previous topic point. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't hear you clearly. Never mind, it's okay. Is it in regards to the question that is on the question box, kindly? Uh, it's on the chat box. I'm not sure if there's a question box separate from the chat. Sometimes there is. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me just look at it and give you a response just now. Sorry, my sound went out. Did you see something? I 
I think I've understood the question you're asking. Uh, when you are, when you say that you pay in, in terms of milestones, again, that also may go into the contract or it may not, depending on what the parties have agreed. If it is upon milestones, like I said, uh, for example, where maybe they have given a stipulation of uh, the prototype, then you pay when the prototype has been done, then maybe the next stage is when the 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 beta uh, period the, yeah, has been completed, that can work. You can include it in your contract, but it doesn't have to be at the very end. It can be in terms of the specific uh, phases of the development. That can be done. It's only that parties have to agree to it. I hope I've answered your question. Yeah, thank you. OK. Uh, I think now we can go into the questions that had been highlighted. Before we move on into non-disclosure agreement, uh, is there anyone with a question in terms of employment contracts and the consultancy contracts? Or any clarification? Okay. Um, yeah, I can see we missed a question here from Kate. Uh, she asked, uh, would my git commits count as uh, me working on a particular time or instead of me clocking, clocking in certain software, would they be tracking of my git commits be a record, a record for me to be working at that particular point? Hello? I seem to have lost you. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, yeah, I can hear you. I, he was asking, like, yeah, Keto does had asked a question earlier. Um, if yes, if Git commits can be proof that you are working as a software engineer, if Git commits can be evidence that you are working as a software engineer. So Sorry, Git I'm commits gonna... being um every time you submit code, there'll be a timestamp along with the code that you completed. Um, that'll be usually on a site like GitHub. Um. And could that could that be used as evidence in court? Yes, anything that you can prove that you've worked. Like I said, mm -hmm. when I began uh, explaining, I did mention that there are very there are different ways to prove that you've been working with them, right? So I'm more of a legal practitioner than I am a developer. So if there is anything that you can have, like the timestamps you're saying, that can prove that you've developed something at a specific period, and you can show that you're the one that has developed it for that company, then that can be used to prove your employment, or it can be used to prove that you've been working for this company, or you've been, you've been contracted to do something for them, whether there's a contract or not. Thank you. Yeah. And also, Ballard asked a question. The fact yes. that I think is a confirmation letter different from an employment contract. Um, yes, it it is different because you see, uh, a confirmation letter, depending on the wording, again, it depends with how the company will word it. A confirmation letter is normally very short. It's just confirming you for uh, your employment. Now, it will it will be very very short. It will tell you that you worked for six months during your probationary period, and now the company wants to confirm you as an employee. It may not have details of your employment. So if it doesn't have details of your employment, please insist on having an employment contract. Most companies will attach the confirmation letter with the employment contract. Make sure, again, don't be given an employment contract and don't sign. It is it doesn't suffice if not signed. It, it also does not suffice where the other party has not signed. So mostly they bring you the contract, they tell you to read it, then you sign, then you take it to the company and most of them don't give it back to you. So make sure once you have signed, ask for a copy that is signed and stamped by the company. So let whoever is in charge, whether the HR, whether the CEO, sign and get a signed copy have yourself a signed copy. Even if you sign and they don't sign, then there is no employment. Even in your consultancy contract, once you sign, let the company that is uh, uh, contracting you sign. Have your copy, let them have their copy. Because even if you say you, you signed and you don't have it, or they, they you signed and they didn't give back to you, then you'll have an issue. I had, a, I had, a, I had an issue like that last year where, an employee was working for a company. 
So during their employment, the company gave them a different contract to create a website for the company. So this different contract was given under an independent contractor, but this person was still an employee within the company. But what happened was the contract that he was given to create the, uh, the website for the company was not signed. So when the matter came and now he needed to be paid because they did give the scope of work, they did say they are going to pay him. So once he'd already done uh, the bulk of the work and had delivered and wanted to be paid, they refused to pay. Why? Because they said that when you are creating this, you are creating as an employee, you are within employment, you are working within the company, within the premises of the company, and you are using your, our resources. So they refused to pay. Yet, they had contracted him to do this away from what he was doing as, a, as an employee. Because even his job description as an employee was not a software developer. He was contracted as, uh, as under, under um, business development. So you see, he was under business development, uh, that, but now you've been given a different contract. But it was not signed. He had it. He had the contract. He signed it, but the company did not sign. So the company refused to pay him. It took a very long time for the company to agree to pay, even after threatening to go to court. But you see, when if you threaten to go to court and you don't have uh, these specifics, like I'm saying, having the contract signed, there is nothing much you're going to be doing to court. So we had to, it, it took some time to get the company to, but they still did not pay him the full amount. They just paid him that what they should have paid him. Yet he had already incurred losses because he'd taken up a loan to develop on behalf of the company considering when they said that they will pay they did not he did not get any deposit so he'd taken about five million to do this development so now he's in debt and the company has refused to pay him. now that makes you understand when i say make sure that everything is signed and you have your documentation because you may go into losses because you will not be able to recover when this has not been written or signed any other question I think I have a question. Yes. Um, in cases like, what about in cases of uh, unpaid internships, whereby you do an internship for three months but not being paid, then they tell you that you'll they'll give you a full time employment. Then when that time when that time reaches, they say that uh maybe the company doesn't have funds, so you extend your internship for another three months or so. So, so how can you address that? Okay. So most internships. Most internships are not payable in Kenya. Are they supposed to be payable? Yes. But most internships uh, under the Kenyan culture, most people assume that uh, you're working to gain experience. So you find that most internships don't pay. But in a situation where you're going for internship, even generally internship, ask for a contract that shows that you're working with a company. If it is unpayable, let it be deemed unpayable. If it is payable, let it be deemed payable. But where you've done your internship, for example, for three months, you've gone into the company, they have said that they will pay you. Most likely they will not. Most internships in Kenya surely don't pay. But assume they, they, they say they'll pay, but there's no contract stipulating that. So you've worked for three months and they've told you they will now give you, uh, they, they want to confirm you for employment. At that specific point, please ask for an employment contract. Because we have a tendency of having employees, employers take advantage, especially of people who are coming from school. Uh, so they are taking advantage of your skill. So they will tell you, again, the job market in Kenya, we, it's, it has become very hard to get a job. So you'll get an internship and then they will tell you, work for three months, then we'll confirm you after three months, come those three months, they don't talk to you for a month, you ask, they tell you. Uh, uh, we are we are still not employing. Maybe work for another three months, then we will let you know. If you are willing to proceed with another three months, well and good. If you're not, then just uh, you can end your internship at that point. What you make sure where you're not being paid for an internship, where they have been very specific, they're not paying you. Please insist on at least getting a recommendation letter by the time you leave. But don't allow yourself to go into different months and months of uh, now working under as an uh, under internship where you're not being paid because you will be exploited. They will keep telling you that they will pay you, but they won't and they won't confirm you. So for, for you to know that you've been confirmed, there has to be an employment contract. 
I also understand the reason you're asking this is I mentioned that if you're working for someone for three consecutive months and uh, at that point they've not given you a contract then now you become an employee, it does not work the same for um, internship. So you, if you've been given a contract, but it is for internship, after three months, uh, your internship ends, then please take a step back and uh, either think whether you want to continue with the company. If they don't, if you continue working for them, for example, now the question you've asked, if you continue working for them, maybe you've chosen to stay and they've, they've told you they'll pay you and then you continue working for them, you continue working for them and they don't, where your three months ended, the internship, and then now you start now work, you start work and now you're working full time, uh, but it's not under internship. Uh, there's no internship contract. They've not specified it's, it's internship. You're just working for them. If they do, at some point, you can actually now either ask for the employment contract like that, or if they don't, you can actually take them to court or you can write them a, a letter indicating that I've been working for three, I've now been working for six months after my internship period. You've not given me a confirmation letter, but the law does suffice that I'm now an employee. So you should be paid according to the market value as to the position you're holding. You have to ask. But yes, you can You can actually ask for your payments now after that internship period. But most internships, they don't pay. But don't allow yourself to be exploited. Okay, thank you. Have I answered? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So can we now get into the questions that had been sent to me? Or is there anyone else with a different question? Um, yeah, uh, just a clarification. Will you just give us some input on data sharing? Like uh, yeah. companies sharing your data for targeted ads and uh, you're not given a consent to, to that close. I'll get into that because I think it covers uh, the question was that was sent to me about sharing uh, of information. I, I think I'll answer that when I get to that point. Any, let, maybe uh, a question before we get into that. Okay, then I think we can proceed. Uh, just give me two minutes, I'll be back. I just want to say I'm kind of shocked at all the documentation needed um, in the U.S. As long as you have like something written, um, I mean you should you should have employment contracts and stuff. Um, but I'm not a lawyer, but you can use anything that's written as evidence and anything that's online. And yeah, how particular this seems seems almost exploitative of employees. I'm sorry, you guys go through it. Yeah. Seems like they're taking anything they can, like any particular they can to take advantage of you. It's ridiculous. Yeah, actually, that is, that is, that's one of the biggest problems you are actually facing over here compared to other countries like the U.S. Yeah, the U.S. isn't perfect. There's definitely employment problems, but, um, and wage theft is a huge problem, but this seems particularly ridiculous. Yeah, you mentioned that you're uh, in the chat. You mentioned that you are you are recruiting Kenyan developers, right? Yeah, um, I'm mostly working on the American side right now. I'm trying to get. Uh, employers to hire, but I'm collecting resumes in case I'm trying to get a portfolio of resumes. So if anyone's interested in uh, being part of the portfolio, I don't have any jobs at the moment, um, but I'm definitely looking and um, trying to connect people. And it's nice to have resumes on hand in case someone's looking for a particular skill. That's nice. So like a portfolio like for any stack, like beat, web beat, mobile beat, AI, like any portfolio, right? Oh yeah. I mean, I mean sorry, I'm using the word portfolio wrong, but um I mean uh I like to have a bunch of resumes. 
Um, and yeah, usually on your resume, you can link to your portfolio. Um, I can put my email in the chat and you can send me your resume if you're interested. I think so. Bikini Nina ka Kenya kwa miaka tatu. Kwa hivyo najua kiswi najua Kenya kidogo lakini ni najua kiswi hili kidogo tu. Ah, oh, nice, nice. So you reside um, over here, or you, you reside in the? Ah, uh, uh, sasa nina ka Minnesota, United States. Um, halafu nili. I was there about a year ago in Kenya. So I go back and forth. That's interesting. I think we can continue now. Oh yeah, sorry. I was just chatting while waiting for you. I didn't mean to interrupt your time. It's okay, no problem. So I think I'd received a question on navigating non-disclosure ag agreements. Uh, where you showcase your work without compromise. Um, I did mention that when you're doing your contracts, you can specify or you can have the non-disclosure clause in your contract, or you can have a non-disclosure agreement separately. So a non-disclosure agreement is particular on what it is that you can disclose to a third party and what it is that you cannot disclose. Again, we will use Bruce Technologies. So for example, um, Bruce is working for, has been contracted by Coca-Cola. The specific uh, information that Coca-Cola may provide to you uh, that you cannot share. Or now to you, you become the receiving party because you are the person who is, uh, Coca-Cola is giving you this information. So you're receiving, the, you're receiving, you're the receiving party. In turn, where you are giving Coca-Cola information, for example, um, whatever you've created, assume it's licensed. And now it's not, uh, you're not giving your ownership right, you're just licensing. So the particulars that you're going to give for the work that you've given, now Coca-Cola becomes the receiving party. So whichever party is receiving the information has a duty to hold that information and not share it, but it is very, it is also specific to certain specifications of the law. So you can either have, um, a unilateral non-disclosure agreement. This is where one party shares confidential information. For example, uh, I'll give a startup shares its business plan with a potential investor. So this is at the very beginning, right? Then you can have a mutual non-disclosure agreement. This is where both parties share confidential information. Like I have said, uh, Bruce Technologies and Coca-Cola, maybe you're collaborating and you're sharing proprietary information. And then you can have a multilateral uh, non-disclosure agreement. This is where multiple parties are involved. This now comes to where there is Bruce Technologies, there is um, Coca-Cola. And now maybe, for example, you have another company that you're outsourcing for a different purpose, but that goes in line with whatever you're creating. So now you have a subcontractor, you have another third party. So now you're sharing this sensitive data within between three people or more that becomes a multilateral uh, non-disclosure agreement. So your disclosure agreement will be detailed by the number of parties that are receiving the information. So uh, how do you then use uh, an NDA in a, in a software development? You can have a pre-contractual negotiations. This is where uh, you can use an, an NDA during your pre-contractual negotiations. This is where you're discussing potential projects and collaborations, or you're discussing project details with a potential development partner. So for example, um, you want to pitch to a company, you have created something that you want to pitch to a company. Let me give an example of what now. You're creating an e-commerce platform, or yes, an e-commerce platform, or what now, or what, um, maybe for Carrefour. So you've created, uh, the application or you've created the product yourself. Now you want to pitch it to Carrefour, right? So you have already, already done basically what it is that you're going to present. So 
So when you're discussing this project details, you can have an undisclosure agreement. Because remember, again, whatever you're pitching to them is your work, is your creativity. So you may have the pre-contractual one that specifies that whatever we discuss here will not be shared out. Because they may now, now pick your idea. You cannot, you cannot limit your idea from being used by other people unless you patent it. But whatever the specific details you may be giving, someone else may be, may be able to use them. So you can't have a pre-contractual NDA that prevents this from happening. Then you can have an, an NDA during the project execution. This is where uh, the develop through the development process to protect the ongoing shared information. This is generally now very common. Now during the development stage, you're sharing information between the company, between yourself, you're sharing, you're getting information from other third parties, you're getting information from clients and customers. So whatever it is that uh, you're getting, uh, that is what, during that project execution, you can have an NDA for that specific purpose. Either maybe you're sharing the source code or other technical specifications during uh, the development. Then you can have a post-project completion NDA. This is to protect any residual confidential information. This is to ensure that there is confidentiality of the, soft, uh, of the software code post-delivery. So you can choose to either have one or you can choose to have an NDA that covers the basis on all this. If you're developing something and you're going to be with this company for maybe a year or so, you can have an NDA that covers the pre-contractual, the during uh, project execution and the post-project completion. Most people have an issue with post-project completion because that is where you are now delivering uh, the software code. So you may find that you don't want this uh, dispersed to other people. So most people particularly want an NDA to cover them during this particular point. So your NDA need, needs to clearly define what is confidential information. You cannot have ambiguity during this process. Specify um, the confidential information. It is not limited to software. It is not only limited to business strategies. It's not not only limited to client data, it is limited to whatever you as a developer or as a client may define to be confidential information. So whatever it is, make sure it is detailed within your NDA. Then you have to have limit, uh, limit the access to confidential information. Who is it that can have access to this um, information? So you may limit access to either the project team and the senior management. So even though there are people with Within the pipeline, who are creating this, uh, who are developing with you, who is it that can have has access to this information? Not everyone may have access, because you may have employees, you may be, you, you may have a team, but only the senior manager has access to specific information. So your NDA has to limit uh, access. It has to have, it has to give specifications of who has access. Then you have to use your NDA has to complement the other contractual uh, contracts that you have. So it has, whatever that, if you if you now have the independent contractor uh, or the consultancy agreement, your, your NDA has to go align, has to go together with whatever terms are in your consultancy agreement, as well as if you have a specific confidentiality agreement, or maybe you have an agreement, a severability agreement after that, Whatever the agreements that may be there for the purpose of this development, your NDA has to go line in hand in hand with this. Then you also have to have a, a clause that details the regular review and update of NDAs because times are changing, things are changing. Uh, for it to remain relevant, you have to keep updating it uh, as the project evolves. So whatever maybe have been there will not be what will be there in an, in a few months time. Huh? So detail exactly what it is that you want to be in the NDA. Um, so I'll, maybe I can use uh, a case study, of, uh, like we were talking about either a fintech uh, startup or a banking app. So detail, detail those specifics. So um, also your NDA has to have breach and legal consequences. So now that you've given the specifics of what is confidential information. 
you given specific of who is the receiving party, you given what is the access or the limit to the access, then now what happens where there is breach? So it has to be particular uh, on the legal actions that can be taken. Can the affected party file a lawsuit? Can, can you go to court to grant an injunction? Let us use an example where the software developer has leaked a proprietary source code to a competitor. So what are the legal actions you can take? You can either file a lawsuit for breach of contract. You can sort. You can seek an injunctive relief. Uh, relief. This is where you go to court to have it granted, an injunction granted, or uh, you can also ask the developer to pay for damages because of the leak. So what? You cannot have an NDA that does not specify the legal actions that will be taken after that. Then what are the outcomes and preventive measures? Uh, make sure that the NDA is very strict to adherence of uh, confidentiality. Always implement a stricter access uh, to controls and monitoring. And then you have to have a regular training of your team on confidentiality and legal obligations for employees. Remember, your contract, um, again, if we are dealing with a consultancy agreement, already has a provision for confidentiality. When I say let it go hand in hand with your NDA, whatever you detailed in your contract as a confidentiality and what it covers and breach of confidentiality, uh, then has to go hand in hand with what is under the NDA. So this is where you are um, you are providing the contract. Remember, as an employee, you may be asked to sign as an an undisclosure agreement. So once you are signing the undisclosure agreement yourself as well, make sure that these particulars are there, understand them. Because very small aspects of disclosure may be what will find, you may find yourself being taken to court for very, very small and minor things that may have been disclosed that were particular in your non-disclosure agreement. If you've not been given an undisclosure agreement, uh, check to see whether your company has the confidentiality clause within your contract. Because especially where there's development, most of the information is very sensitive. I think I have covered uh, non-disclosure in case there is any question, we shall highlight it after that. Um, the other question I had received was on customer information. Um, just give me a minute. The question stated, how should one handle customer information collected through online registration? And when should I be liable for breach of confidentiality? So we've covered a bit of confidentiality. So now, customer information and customer information that is collected. When you're creating, be it an app, be it a website, whatever it is you're creating, you have noticed that there has the easily a requirement that is there for you to attach a privacy policy, right? There's also a requirement for you to attach the terms uh, and conditions of use of the website or of uh, whatever it is that you have developed. And then there is also the pop-up that comes where you're talking, where you're told uh, that the, could have addressed it, the privacy, the privacy policy. So those are some of the things that will cushion you when it comes to customer information. But before we get there, as a um, developer, let's go back to the Data Protection Act. We did talk about the Data Protection Act. Under the Data Protection Act, it has now established the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner. So under the, the Office of the, it's called the ODPC, under the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner, where acts are viewed as data breach, that is where they are reported. So a customer may feel that um, the information has been shared wrongly. Let's go to the question that has been asked where your information or your photos or whatever it is has been used by the company without your consent. You can't report the company under the office of the data of the ODPC, okay? So we have two sides to this. There is where you as the developer, you, you have breached and where there is you who is employed, you feel that your information has been breached. So let's begin with the first one so that I can answer the question that had been asked. So where you are an employee, for example, uh, let me use the example of my firm. So 
I have employees. So when I'm when I created the website, of course, I did use my employees because they are part of the firm. So my employees would have easily sued me for using their images, for using their information, if there was no consent. So what did I do to mitigate it? If you're going to use anyone's image that is not AI generated, please secure consent. Have written consent where the person says that they've allowed you to use their images for the purpose of the development of that website only. And they will also exempt you that if, you, if for example, there are images that have been used are going to attract any monetary any monetary what if they're going to to attract anything that is going to be monetary they are not going to ask you for it they're not going to sue you for it so your consent agreement with any person whose images you're going to use has to be very detailed and particular on that aspect that they've agreed that you use their their information they have agreed that you use their images they are not doing this for monetary gain and they will not come and ask you for anything monetary after that so this is you see the way people have billboards those have they they either have consented to have them used and if they've not uh they've not if they have consented to have them used and they are paid for it or they are not paid for it so if you're going to develop and use anyone's image please make sure there is consent you cannot just go and download anybody's photo on online and post it on whatever it is that you're using unless you're using something that is ai generated and even now anything that is ai generated you have the stipulation to write and explain that is this is ai generated right so I think I've answered the question that uh, had been asked. So have have consent. If someone has not asked for your consent, then you can sue them. You can sue them for using your images and you can ask for damages because you did not consent. And this it can be done under the office of the ODPC. Or you can just go to court directly. But even if you go to court directly, they will still return you and tell you to go to the ODPC. But you can also begin with writing them a letter and telling them to pull, to pull, to pull the images down and uh, pay you compensation for using your images where you had not consented. So that works where someone uses your images. So even you as a developer, if you're going to use someone's image, make sure they have consented in writing that there is a consent written. The same applies to, you do find uh, sometimes uh, photographers, you will go to a studio, they will take your photos, then they'll want to use their photos on their website they want to use their photos on their instagram pages all these things can lead you to be sued if, if these people have not consented directly all right then now i think i've answered that now we can move to you as a developer how do you now make sure that you protected the data you collect so first like i said uh, you need to have the privacy policy in whatever you're going to create make sure you attach the privacy policy it is normally it's something someone should be able to read. These are the things that now we as lawyers create for you. We create for you the privacy policies in reference to whatever it is you're creating. We are very particular. Your privacy policy may also have the ambit where uh, your information, it will specify that uh, we will be telling you what information we are collecting, how we are going to use it. And at the very bottom, it will highlight that the, part the person using the site has consented. Then you will also have terms and conditions for use of that site. I'll give an example of a hotel, a hotel establishment that has created their website online. So you have the terms and conditions. It will be saying, how are you going to use this site? For what purpose? What information are we going to collect? What it is that we expect of you, the client? What it is that you can and cannot do on the site? It will stipulate the, the things we normally say that this site can only be accessed by someone who is 18 years of age. This is it, this is what they can do, this is what they cannot do. Uh, you, will be, you will now be telling them how to use the site and contrary to which, then there are, the, there are parties that will be in breach. This applies for also maybe something like a supermarket where now you're, you're using online payments. These terms and conditions for use will be detailing your payment schedules. So we have, Again, you can use the hotel. Someone has booked online, they need to pay. The terms and conditions of use will be detailing how you're going to pay, how you're going to collect your credit or your debit card information, how you're going to use that information, what happens if the billing goes wrong, 
uh, how do they recover the amount, such how those details have to be there. So that is how you, you protect yourself. Now, this is you protecting yourself from the person using the site saying that the information was used wrongly because you have detailed how you're going to use it, it is there. So whatever, when they decide to use the site or when they decide to use the product, they have agreed to your terms and conditions. So do not upload anything online that does not have these particulars. Uh, the other thing as a developer within the Kenyan landscape, you will need to register as a data handler. So now the requirement in the data protection is very specific on you either being a data processor or a data controller. So because you're collecting people's information, you have to be registered to do so. This is where most people, uh, we go back to the example of Nivas. So when Nivas was uh, was uh, was reported to the ODPC and they had to pay a hefty fine and they were also called into parliament to explain why there was a data breach, these were the some of the particulars that were being asked. Have you actually registered as a data processor or a data controller? Because now where you have not, you're in breach of the laws that we have. So who is the data processor and who is the data controller? I think the easiest thing I can give is an example. Again, we use Bruce Technologies. So Bruce Technologies can either be a data processor or a data controller. A data processor is a person who processes the data on behalf of the data controller. And the data controller is the person who decide, decides why and how the data is processed. So using Bruce Technologies, I have said Bruce Technologies can either register to be a data controller and a data processor. Bruce Technologies has been contracted by Coca-Cola to create uh, a product. So in this instance, because the product is Coca-Cola's, the information they will be collecting will be for purpose of Coca-Cola. And Coca-Cola are the ones who are going to be running the site. They're the ones who are going to be collecting the information from their own. Coca-Cola becomes the data handler, or becomes the data controller. And Bruce, who is co collecting the information on behalf of Coca-Cola, becomes the data processor. So Bruce requires, Bruce Technologies has been hired as a company. So Bruce Technologies needs to have been registered as a data processor. Now, let us work with Bruce Technologies in itself, where they have not been hired to contract uh, a job for someone else. So Bruce Technologies is creating a site for themselves. For example, they are creating a website for Bruce Technologies, right? So Bruce Technologies, now in this instance, becomes the data controller because whatever information, they're the ones who are deciding how this information will be collected and for what purpose. But Bruce Technologies is a company. Bruce himself, whoever is creating the site, is the one who is collecting the data. So Bruce becomes the data processor. So whoever is collecting, uh, whoever is processing the data becomes the data processor, and whoever the data is being collected on behalf becomes a data controller. So wherever you're working, you will need to figure out at what position you are. The requirement for registration as a data processor and as a data handler is not for everyone. It is for a company that uh, has uh, at least between the payments, the pay not, not it is not for everyone. It is actually for everyone now. Before it was not for everyone, there are exemptions to it. But now, since everyone is collecting data, you still have to register. But the requirements are different between a person who is uh, having a, who is between zero to 10 employees, then there is the specifications on how you're supposed to do your registration. But the most important one has been uh, your turnover. What amount of money are you collecting in the process of your job? So most people who've been required to register as data processors and data controllers have been, especially people who have a turnover of about 5 million and above. Um, but now, recently, because of how the landscape is changing, even anyone who is earning about a million shillings is required to have registered. So what I advise my clients, it doesn't matter whether you are having a turnover of 100,000 or you're having a turnover of a million shillings, please register to avoid any issues. Please register as a data processor, mostly for the people in this session, you may be required to register as data processors. Please do so. It is only, the lowest amount is 5,000 a year. 
your your license is renewable every year at 5000 so if you can please do it. don't look at the parameters of the amount of money because as long as you're processing that it is a requirement it may not be very strict right now but it is becoming more and more it is becoming a requirement that most people are looking at again as a um, software developer we have tenders so once you go to the procurement site you will find that either county governments or independent companies are tendering or have put out um, an advertisement for people to tender in for software development for creation of the di uh, digital products you cannot apply for a tender in kenya if you're not registered as a data processor or a data controller in addition to all other requirements that you may need to be registered as a company to have a KRA pin, you cannot have register, you cannot tender for anything under the government or privately. If you're not registered as a data processor, you cannot uh, tender for anything where you have not been certified by ICT. You remember when I talked about the ICT regulations? So ICT needs to give you certification. So such things have to be the normal licenses that are required, you have to have them. But most importantly now, going back to the issue of customer information, to protect yourself, make sure you're registered as a data processor, especially where you're working independently and not under a company, register as a data processor. That is something that we can do for you. So once if any one of you may require that, then you can always reach out. Uh, that is mainly what will cover you in terms of customer information. Whatever you collect, other than the NDAs, the confidentiality clause, the privacy policies, the terms and conditions, the other most important one is registration as a data processor. Um, I think uh, the final question I had was on uh, leaving work a bit what was it? A prematurely exiting job and asking for enumeration. I think this I had uh, covered a bit on in terms of contract. So um, where you choose to leave your employment, uh, because either it is not working for you, again, your employment contract will what, is what will inform your decision. If your employment contract is specific on you giving one month's notice or your consultancy contract is specific on you giving notice, then give notice. Where you do not want, where you you decide you want to resign today then and you don't give notice then the company has uh, the right to take up whatever payment you are supposed to have been given for that month for example if you uh, you are supposed to be paid 60000 for this month they will take it as payment in lieu of notice because you did not give notice so where you decide to resign uh, just like that for whatever reasons, you can cite your reasons, or you can just decide that this is it you don't want. Make sure before you do that all your dues are paid other than what will now be payment in due. If you have any other unpaid dues, make sure you write to the company for them to be able to pay out whatever it is that they've not paid you. Uh, again, leaving work, exiting a job, and asking for remuneration for day's work, again, will also... Like I said, it's either under the contract. If it is not under a contract, you did not have a contract completely, but you've been still been working. Yeah, you can ask for the day's work. If you're being paid 60000 a month, then you can tabulate that to see how much it is that you're supposed to be paid per day. So if you decide uh, to quit your job on the 5th of June and you had been paid until the 30th of May, then you tell them to pay you between 1st and 5th June. You calculate the amount of money that you should have been paid. They, sh they are supposed to pay you for the day's work. Um, I think I have covered that question unless there is anything else. Um, what I can say then after that is I know I have covered a lot about what you're supposed to know. So the question becomes, after all this information, how do we as lawyers help you to navigate um, these issues? Um, mostly where we help you is, let's go back to the beginning. You've been employed, review of contracts. We do review your contracts for you where you don't have contracts, where you're an independent contractor, then we create the software development contracts for you. Or if you're given one, we can review them for you. We do represent you in your matters. Uh, where you are employed, and uh, maybe you've been given a notice to show cause for a disciplinary matter, where you've been given a notice to show cause because of something the company feels you're not doing right, uh, before they actually terminate you, you have the right to have your advocate present during your disciplinary hearing. 
so that is where we come in uh then we can we do court representations where your payments and dues have not been paid we can come in and do demand letters where you're complaining you want to cite the company for something that is under your contract that has not been done then we can do the same for you uh other than when it comes to creating your NDA contract, mostly contract review, contract creation that we do. When it comes to registration, especially when it comes to the ODPC, when it comes to procuring your licenses as a developer in the country, then we can be able to do that for you. Whatever we have covered today, maybe, and you'd want it in writing, uh, or you'd want something that you can refer to, we call them legal opinions, we can create that for you. Uh, where you want to maybe now go and teach your team uh, what it is that we've discussed, we can have the legal opinions for you. We do facilitate such webinars for for a particular person, for a particular company. Uh, personally, if you just want to have a consult, we can have consultations. But mostly where your lawyer comes in is mostly to protect you and your rights. Because like I said, the HR mostly protects the company. So you as the employee or you as the independent contractor has to always look out for yourself. So uh, my advice always is don't wait for the fire. Uh, approach your advocate before, especially don't sign a contract. Then when things have now become very hectic, that's when you look for an advocate. It's easier to deal with it before than it is to cure after. So always get an advocate, always engage an advocate, especially when it comes into contracts, because the details are in the fine print. You find some very, very small wordings, very specific, specific wordings can make your contracts unbearable at the place of work. So that is particularly what we do for you as advocates, and uh, we are always here for you when we have questions. Other than that, if there's any other question that maybe had not been highlighted or you feel I have not responded to, I think now we are at the point where I can receive questions. Does anyone has a, does anyone have a question? Any question? Firstly, I'll start with asking. Uh, but if everyone is afraid of of uh, speaking up, you can also. Ah, uh, Bruce, it seems like you are breaking. Uh, message box. <laughs> Am I the only one struggling to to hear Bruce, or is everyone just listening to him? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, just saying that if anyone uh, feels afraid to speak up, um, they can just drop a, a message at the chat. Hello. Yes, Ken. Yes. Yes, uh, I have a question. Uh, the first, uh, actually two questions. So my first question was, um, okay, most of us, sometimes we end up working maybe two or three jobs at the same time. 
So let's say, for example, if, uh, you're working for company A and uh, you're in a contract, you're written maybe eight to five. So that's, 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 that's the number of hours you're supposed to be working for that, con for that company. And let's say for me, for this week, uh, the, your senior had asked you to maybe work on X, Y, Z features, and you feel that you've completed those features. So is it illegal as per your contract to during those company hours to work on another project? And will that be enough grounds for the company to dismiss you? My second question will be to uh, Kate Squell. Uh, I wanted to have to repeat what she had said in regards to her company. Uh, I had issues with my audio at the time. Thank you. I think I can respond to that. Huh? Um, where you are employed, the company assumes that whatever you're doing within their company time is their job. So can you take up something else and do during your work hours? As long as you have completed what it is that you're supposed to, then yes, you can. But I always advise, I'm not saying this legally, that yes, you can, because you can go to put it with it and say this is legal. Company hours are company hours, and the company expects you to be working and doing what it is they're paying you for within those 40, mostly it's a 40-hour week. So whatever it is that you're supposed to be doing within those 40-hour week, 40 hours um the company expects it is you are delivering what it is that they expect you to deliver so can you finish your work between monday and wednesday and then you work on whatever else you'd want to to do if you can yes my advice don't get caught because yes it is grounds for the company to say that um you are you are either not delivering on their job or you're doing something else because when you are you are in your unemployment, um, particularly in Kenya, the the assumption is if you're working eight to five, you if you're going to get another job, then it should be between five to ten. Whatever else you're doing, we should be within those other hours because these hours are being paid. So if you can, and you're making sure that your work is delivered you can, but don't get caught because yes, the company will assume, will automatically assume that you're not delivering because you're already occupied elsewhere. They can actually terminate you for that. So I understand most of your jobs are online. So whatever it is that you do, just don't get caught because yes, they will actually assume that uh, you're not delivering or even if you can show you're delivering, the company will automatically assume you're not delivering or you're not, they're not, well, they're not doing enough for you, enough for you to take up something else. So it can be grounds. It is actually grounds for them to say that you're not doing your job as expected. So do it, but don't get caught. Because if you get caught, yes, they will, they will terminate your employment. So whatever else it is that you do, um, either do it after, and if you can do it within your time, your work hours, just make sure you're very discreet about it. Otherwise, advocate for a remote job. If if you can, because right now most jobs, especially for online developers are online, if you can, please advocate for an online job because then at that point, um, you're able to maneuver your work hours the way you want to. That would be my advice. I have well, seen a question. Yeah, in regard to Tim's other thing, I don't want to take space away. He can message me if he wants to, um, but I don't want to take space away from the main topic. Okay. I have seen a question that is asking, is it illegal for companies to indicate that you'll be required to work overtime from time to time in your contract? It is not illegal. It is actually very important. These are the things you need to look at before you sign a contract. So that if it does not work for you, please highlight before you sign. Most companies, I'll give an example of the Matatu sector in Kenya. Your contract will stipulate that they expect you to work even on Saturdays and Sundays, right? Because again, if you're driving a Matatu, it doesn't mean that people don't go home on weekends. So for the Matatu industry, they will specify that your contract, uh, you're supposed to work uh, maybe up to Friday, you have one off day. They may stipulate your off days on Saturday and they expect you to work on Sunday. 
Particularly in Kenya, we expect you're working from Monday to Friday. So if you're working overtime, the company should indicate. Most companies do indicate that, uh, especially for software developers, they will expect you to work overtime, but the overtime is not paid because they do say that when a site uh, crashes or such things, they are unprecedented and they are unexpected. And under your contract, you're supposed to come, you're supposed to be able to sort out that out. So some stipulations in most contracts I have seen, especially with software developers, they are very particular that you'll be expected to work overtime, but it will not be paid. So if you're not comfortable with that, please detail that you want your overtime to be paid and how overtime will be calculated. But it is important. If it is not, if it is not in your contract, actually ask what happens in case I work overtime. So that you know. But where the company does not detail and you ask and they don't specify and then they terminate you, we do calculate overtime because we will assume your working hours are eight to five. If you can have a log or you can prove that you worked past eight to between past five, then yes, we will actually ask for your courage to be paid. Even where, where you choose to resign, we can't ask for it to be paid because those are unpaid hours. Even if in public holidays, let, let it also be specific. Are you working on public holidays and, or not? What happens if you work on public holidays? Is it half day and is it paid or is it unpaid? Any other question? I think I have a question for you, Akili. Yeah. So um, how can, like, uh, in case somebody wants to reach out to you, how can we find you? Uh, do you have social handles or how can we get to you? Yes, we do. I will share them with you, but I prefer giving you my contact directly. So I will I will provide the same message, the same uh, contacts uh, in the chat box for anyone who wants to reach out to me. But yes, we do have a website that you can check out our website and see what we do. You can also, our social media pages, are, we are just working on them now, but we'll also be able to share them the same with you in time. But for my contact, I will, I will make sure I, I include it in the chat box just now for anyone who'd want to contact me. Okay. Yes. Kunti Karanja is asking in the chat, uh, is asking Kate where he can contact her. How can he message you? Okay, I'll respond. Does anyone else have a question? Does... I've shared my number with my email. So if anyone wants to contact me, they can contact me through either of that. Either of the contacts are provided. Okay. Thank you. So the details are in the chat. Um, does anyone have a question? Okay. So if not, I guess I'll just wrap it up then. Thank you. Thank you, Akili, for giving us those thoughtful insights for this like session. Most of the things actually I wish I had known earlier um speaking from a person like i am a person who got was once fired and it was i was wrongfully fired actually yeah and maybe if i could have known this earlier maybe i could have admitted that or maybe the consequences could be called it to be dire but thank you thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us your insights today
um before I wrap it up uh I don't know if you have any like any parting thoughts last words to say to us I think I'd want to say thank you very much for having me uh, I hope I have been uh, been able to help even in a small capacity because this extends beyond I, I've just been able to highlight what I think was most important but um thank you for having me Thank you for the time. I hope we can continue talking more. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Um, then I can be able to see how best to help. If you have any pending matters, like you said, uh, you are wrongfully fired or you're having a certain situation right now that you do want us to handle, please feel free to reach out. Then we can see the best way to help you. Yes, and you can always uh, share my contact with anyone else who, do, who has any other issue other than uh, legal and tech. This is majorly what I do. I'm, I'm more on um, law and digital law, but I also practice in other areas. So if you have any, any other areas of practice that you feel a bit of a challenge, you can always contact me. Thank you very much. I would also want to thank uh, who, uh, I think it was Bruce who contacted me. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for team who also highlighted the same to me uh, some time ago about the challenges that you may be having. So I think as a team, you're also working very well together. Thank you. Thank you. And we can always uh, have um, a consecutive talk after this. Okay. Uh, before you sum it up, I think Kate has asked a question. Do you know anyone that does contract law for foreign companies? Uh, myself? Uh, do I know anyone who does uh, contract law for foreign companies? Yes, yes, she can contact. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Um. Once again, thank, thank you, and thank you everyone who has joined us today. Um. I know it has been a long and informative session. So, in case you had missed out some parts, the session has been recorded and it will be uploading the session on YouTube. Uh, with due time so if any if i if any resources that will be needed to be shared with you i'll just share them with a meetup link or in the group we have a whatsapp group um if you would lead them so let me just drop the link i don't know if bruce do you have the access to the link for the whatsapp group let me just check it out then drop it in the chat so if you haven't joined you can join us and keep the conversation going yeah so thank you guys for coming um my name is Alvin George and this is Plata Kisumu and we looking forward to have you next time Bruce do you have anything to say to sum up the meeting um maybe just to send a thank you to uh Wakili for being here with us and giving us some insight some insightful thoughts for about uh, law and tech. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, much of it will be discussed off chat. Like maybe uh, as much as saying we consult, uh, we consult uh, you for our legal issues, maybe the legal fees that are attached to that uh, consultations. But that is some discussion that can be discussed off call if someone is interested in that. Uh, apart from that, um, Thank you again all for being here with us and uh, sticking it and uh, uh, staying tuned in all this long. Thank you again so much. Okay. That being said, I want to wish everyone a good night and a happy weekend coming up. Yep, stay safe. Thank you.